We're live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for our live session on May 16th, 2019. I'm going to hand it over to Chris, and then we will start with questions. Hi, and welcome, everyone. Once again, from London, where I will be for another month or so. Um, ready for your questions in this next live session for the online courses. All right, the first question comes from an email from Steve Norman who asks, what is the likelihood that there is a von Neumann probe in our solar system or even in the asteroid belt, but we just can't distinguish it from an asteroid? Um, an interesting speculation. So to back up a little for people who don't know the term, the von Neumann probe refers to a um, basically, it's an idea from Johnny von Neumann, who was a computer science pioneer of the 1950s and 60s, a Princeton professor, who pretty much uh, was one of the founders of modern computer science in a theoretical sense. Uh, and he was a wide thinker, and he came up with the idea that an advanced civilization might readily have the ability, as we might do in some small number of decades, uh, to send out space probes that could mine asteroids or uh, rocky surfaces and make replicas of themselves and then prolifer proliferate sort of exponentially through the galaxy, uh, traveling even at modest fractions of the speed of light, they would still propagate very quickly. Um, and these, of course, could be sentient probes that would record and see what was going on, look for life and transmit the answers back to the home planet of the Earth or their home planet uh, at the speed of light. Um, obviously, probes like that might be very small. Any t uh, civilization able to make such probes would make them as small as they could because of the energy costs of accelerating to large speeds. And so they would be very hard to detect. They'd be smaller than an asteroid, I suspect, if they existed. Um, it's an interesting speculation. So it's essentially the same as asking, what are the odds that some other nearby advanced civilization has created this technology and propagated it through their part of the Milky Way to see uh, whether there was life in that part of the Milky Way. Um, and, and that's a completely unknown estimation because we don't know how frequent intelligent life is and certainly technology that life might have that it could deploy in this way. So I think it's just a provocative thought that there are von Neumann machines, that they exist and they, they might be out there. Uh, and there's some classic science fiction that revolves around this too. Um, so, so I don't obviously have a firm answer to the question because there's no way to answer the question. Uh, it's just an intriguing proposition. Ready for the next question. All right, uh, the next question is from one of our live viewers. Uh, David Weidman asks, uh, can you talk about fractals and uh, their use in astronomy and possible importance for a new gravity theory? I'm not sure of the connection to gravity theory, but fractal uh, a fractal is a self-similar uh, geometric uh, shape, basically. So um, the classic example, going back to Benoit, Benoit Mandelbrot, the French mathematician who really pioneered uh, the idea of fractals almost 50 years ago now, um, is a coastline. So observe from a, a high up satellite, a coastline has corrugations and undulations and beaches and curves and angular and uh, irregular shapes. And the idea is if you zoom in on it at, at larger and larger resolution, this, these shapes are roughly similar. So it's very difficult to tell what scale you're looking at until eventually you get down to the scale of individual beaches and coves and rocky outcroppings and so on. Um, so that's a fractal. It's a shape which has the same character regardless of what scale you look at it. Uh, a coastline is a one-dimensional example of a fractal, but you can have self-similar uh, surfaces in two dimensions or self-similar volumes actually in three dimensions. Um, to give an astronomy example of this, the large scale structure of the universe, which is to say the distribution of galaxies in space on large scales, uh, you can attribute a fractal dimension to that, which is to say if you imagine sort of blurring out galaxies so they form a continuous uh, surface joining one galaxy to the next in space, because galaxies are small compared to the space between them, 
then uh, as measured back in the 1980s, I think the fractal dimension of the universe is about 1.7. Uh, where one would be string-like, two would be sheet-like, and three would be a sort of uh, corrugated three-dimensional surface like a sponge. So 1.7 means that it's like a pizza, pizza dough, if you like. So the universe is halfway between strings and sheets. Um, so fractal ideas are there in cosmology because gravity exerts its uh, acts over infinite scale and so it produces self-similar structures and self-similar structures are pretty familiar in astronomy especially in cosmology um, the fact that gravity produces self-similar structures is simply a function of its infinite range and it being an inverse square law uh, it's actually a pretty natural attribute of an inverse square law to form structures that way so that's the connection that i know of with gravity theory i don't think there's any deeper a more profound connection um, uh, but it's intriguing certainly because it means that in the universe as in many other physical situations there's no particular characteristic scale when you have fractal situation there is no preferred physical scale ready for the next question all right thank you Chris our next question is from a viewer who's on with us live Ramnath Kumar asks um, what exactly is the significance of the recent photo of a black hole? And um, somebody else has a similar uh, interest in it and asks what kind of telescope was used to take this picture. So maybe you could kind of give an overview and right. then talk about the significance. The, the famous uh, image, it, you know, it looks like an orange uh, donut, irregular donut around a black circle is the first image ever taken of the event horizon of any black hole. The black hole is in the center of the M87 galaxy, 55 million light years away. Uh, the event horizon size is about 15 or 18 times the size of the solar system, which is a very small physical scale for something that has a mass of about 6 billion times the mass of the sun. So those are the basic attributes of the black hole. Uh, the image was taken with an array of radio telescopes at short radio wavelengths because um, those wavelengths can penetrate the gas and dust in the center of M87 or any other galaxy, including our own. So that's pretty much the best way to take a picture of a black hole. Uh, because when you combine information from radio telescopes separated over large distances on the Earth, essentially spanning the Earth's surface, you simulate a telescope that has the resolution of a telescope the size of the Earth. And a radio telescope that's the size of the Earth has a much better angular resolution than any optical telescope, even though it's using long waves and typically resolution uh, gets worse with wavelength. So that's why you use radio telescopes. That's why you need an array of telescopes. It was a very special situation. It's called the Event Horizon Telescope. So it's not actually one telescope. So it's about a dozen uh, scattered around the world, one of which is on a mountaintop near where I work. And, and on Kitt Peak, others of which are in Chile and Antarctica and Europe and Australia. They're really well separated around the world. Uh, and it's the first, but probably not the only picture of a black hole uh, this facility is going to be able to take. So we can look forward to a handful more pictures in the next year. Ready for the next question? All right. Uh, the next question is again from a viewer who is on with us live. And um, Rami Ahmad, who is on with us live, is interested in um, something called Starlink, a global, global orbital network called Starlink, and wonders if you are familiar with it and if you know anything about the advantages and risks involved in it. And um, if you don't, then we can move on to the next question. <laughs> uh, unless it's the interstellar internet or interstellar, sorry, interplanetary internet, then I, I'm not familiar with the term, so I probably should pass to the next question. All right, um, so the next question is from Devin B, who's on with us live, who asks, does the magnetic field uh, or radioactive particles of a pulsar continuously erupt from the north and south poles, or does it just appear that way due to the spinning nature of the collapsed star? Um, the spinning neutron star obviously has a lot of angular momentum because this is a, a star that had a, a modest amount of angular momentum and then collapsed enormously. So by conservation of angular momentum, 
the spin rate increases uh, by a very large factor as the star collapses, actually by a factor of about a million or so. So mm -hmm. the uh, pulsars we've detected, which are neutron stars with radio hotspots that allow us to detect them, have periods that ranging from a few seconds down to uh, milliseconds, so a thousandth of a second, incredibly fast spin rate. Now, the magnetic field of a pulsar is just like the pole, the dipole magnetic field of any star, um, and we therefore, and it does accelerate radiation uh, mildly because it's a radio object, and that acceleration is occurring by the cyclotron process which is a standard physics mechanism, that radio polarization would be circular if you could observe it with a radio telescope. Um, and so there is radio emission from the poles of the pulsar, uh, for radio waves that are accelerated by the cyclotron process. Uh, this brightest amount of radio emission and the thing that allows pulsars to be detected is usually a hot spot. So it's an irregularity on the surface of the neutron star, which is to say it's not really its polar region, north or south, but actually a hot spot uh, on the surface of the star where there's a particularly large amount of emission. And as the star spins, uh, that hot spot and the radio emission from it uh, will sweep out, um, you know, a beam, if you like, across the sky. And if it happens to intercept the Earth and our radio telescopes, we can detect it as a pulsar. So the pulsar uh, set of objects is not actually the basic, simple, and low-level radio emission from the dipole magnetic field of the pulsar, but actually from a more intense region of radio emission that represents a hot spot or an irregularity in the surface. Um, that radio emission also can change because as the neutron star is under enormous mechanical stresses as it spins, it's very dense matter, uh, it can redistribute those stresses in star quakes, essentially, neutron star quakes. This is a well understood phenomenon theoretically and it's observed observationally. And those uh, star quakes will cause glitches in the radio emission, changes in its strength, and sometimes changes in the frequency of the pulsar itself as it redistributes its matter. So it's a pretty interesting phenomenon now that has been observed in, in dozens of pulsars. Ready for the next question? Excellent. Our next question is from David May, who is on with us live who asks, could you explain what it is about the internal activity of quasars um, that m makes it so that they can be established or used as standard candles or distance measurements? Yes, um, quasars, uh, people would like to be able to use quasars as standard candles. Standard candle is a, obviously an archaic term in astronomy because referring to candles which don't obviously stay lit out in the vacuum of space, is, is a very old-fashioned way of referring to it. We'll call them standard light bulbs. Astronomers crave anything that acts like a standard light bulb that has a constant amount of light emission so that we can judge its distance by the inverse square law and how bright it appears to be. Uh, type 1 supernovae are the classic standard candles that are used in cosmology out to large distances. Since quasars are the brightest objects in the universe, it would be very appealing if some of them how they had standard amounts of emission, because then we could use the brightness of quasars to very large distances, essentially back to 13 or 13 and a half billion years ago, almost to the Big Bang, uh, to measure distances and probe cosmic evolution. Um, so at the moment, there is no good handle on quasars or no way of observing quasars where they look like really good standard candles. Remember, supernovae, uh, the gold standard for a standard candle, are uh, similar from one to the next to about 15% difference in luminosity. Uh, quasars vary in luminosity by factor um, from one to the next at a given redshift by factors of thousands or tens of thousands. Now, there are subsets of active galaxies which are slightly more regular in their properties, but there is no subset of quasars that acts anything like the standard candles we've seen when we look at supernovae. So although people are still trying to do this, and there are papers every now and then that use some attribute of quasars or some subset of quasars to argue that they might be a standard candle, it's not, not good enough as a standard candle to be used effectively for cosmology. Ready for the next question. 
The next question comes from, <clears throat> excuse me, the next question comes from Destined Life, who is on with us live, who asks, how are we sure about the age of the universe? There might be some stars which might not be observable today to make sure the true age of the universe is accurate uh, because the universe is expanding. So how can we tell? Right. The, the best, when you read that the universe is 13.8 billion years old and that you read, in fact, in the papers that claim this, that the accuracy of this number is only a couple of percent. So it's a pretty good number. You remember that number comes entirely from a cosmological model. That's from our Big Bang model. That's from our measurement of the current expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble constant, and our measurement of the deceleration and then acceleration of the universe over time due to dark matter and dark energy. And in that evolving universe model, uh, if we know what the constituents, the ingredients of the universe are, we can calculate in the model the age or the time to the Big Bang. And that's where that number comes from. And because cosmology is becoming a precision science, those measurements are actually quite good. And they tend to agree with each other or used differently. So we're pretty confident that the age really is 13.8 billion years. But as the question implies, it would be really good to check this age, which is measured entirely by the expanding universe model itself, with a direct measurement of age of the, say, oldest objects in the universe. When we try and do this with stars, we, there are ways to measure the age of very old stars. The oldest stars we can find, for example, in the galaxy tend to be stars with very few heavy elements in the halo of our galaxy. There are uh, sort of cosmochronometer measurements, which mean measuring the age of things using their chemical properties and understanding stellar evolution. And, and that's consistent with the cosmological age. So the oldest stars that we can find have ages that are roughly 13 billion years. But the error on those measurements for an individual star is quite large, maybe a billion years. So they are useful cross checks on the expanding universe age but they don't uh, push it, if you like, or they don't improve on it. Alternatively, you can try and measure the age of stars in the highest range of galaxies we find, because those are galaxies seen at large look-back times, and people have done that too. And that's also consistent with the Big Bang age, 13.8 billion years. Uh, so, so I guess the good news in these measurements is that when people have measured the age of stars or galaxies, no age has been found that conflicts with the expanding universe number of 13.8 billion years. They're all consistent with it, which essentially corroborates the Big Bang model. And that's the way astronomers choose to look at this. Ready for the next question. Uh, Will has a question. Who's, uh, Will is on with us live and has a related question um, about Hubble telescope measurements um, have suggested that the universe may be expanding faster than predicted. Um, is that true? And do, would this have any interesting implications? Uh, yes, there is a somewhat of a controversy in cosmology at the moment. And so it's been present in a series of research papers in the last year or so, where the uh, expansion rate of the universe measured through cosmological measurements, that is the microwave background and modeling the expansion history of the universe, which obviously includes a, the current measure of the expansion rate, as well as the history of that expansion rate. That can be compared to the direct measurement of the local expansion rate uh, from objects in the nearby universe, galaxies, using variable stars like Cepheid variables and so on. And the most recent work using the Hubble Space Telescope on the local expansion rate measured with galaxies that are a few tens of millions of years light years away, is intriguingly different. It's a slightly higher expansion rate or a slightly higher Hubble constant in the low 70s of kilometers per second per megaparsec as opposed to the uh, expanding universe Big Bang microwave background uh, expansion rate, which is in the high 60s. That difference of five or so is only about seven or eight percent, but that actually is a serious problem because both of these measurements claim to be more accurate than that. And so they disagree at roughly the two or three sigma level, which in science is not a huge disagreement, but it's enough to be worrying. And this disagreement hasn't really improved as people gather more data. So this is brewing as a little bit of a crisis in cosmology. One way that it might be explained is if, the unit, if we're in a local bubble, so to speak, 
that the nearby part of the universe on scales of tens of millions of light years is lower density than slightly more distant regions, and that would cause the local expansion rate to be a little higher than the cosmic average on somewhat larger scales. So that would mean we're in a slightly anomalous region. Um, that could explain this difference. But otherwise, or it's possible there's systematic error in the way the measurements are made uh, using standard candles in the local universe, and people still worry about that, the use of supernovae and the calibration of that technique. So it's unresolved, but it is sitting there as a bit of a problem in cosmology that isn't going away at the moment. Ready for the next question. Uh, the next question is from Ilsa Martin, who's on with us live, who asks, how do we know so much about black holes since no space probe has ever been inside the event horizon? Um, yeah, good question. I and mean, well, you don't actually know that much about black holes. We have uh, catalogs of maybe 50 or so stellar mass black holes, the kind of black holes that result when massive stars die in binary systems. And we know their masses and their orbital properties and that's about all. We infer or can calculate from theory the size of their event horizons. We can uh, estimate based on their accretion rate how much mass they're gathering from their companion stars and converting it to energy. But really, there's very little information. The mass of black holes and galaxies are in the same boat. We really know very little about them. We measure their mass directly and we estimate their event horizon size with the one exception of M87, where the event horizon size was measured directly. So we really don't know a lot about black holes other than that. We don't know what happens to the material inside a black hole. We don't know if the event horizon hides a singularity or an infinite cusp in mass density, which theory predicts and which is a problem for the theory. We don't know um, if black holes uh, trap information in a way that seems to violate the theories of quantum physics. There's a lot of things we still don't know about black holes. So I would say it's very early days in our understanding of black holes. Ready for the next question. Thank you, Chris. Our next question is from Robert Baker, who is on with us live, who asks, is there any evidence for longitudinal waves going through the arms of a spiral galaxy? Um, there is an indirectly sense uh, for that. Um, the question of waves in a spiral galaxy is important because it's the density waves in the arms of a spiral galaxy that give rise to the spiral structure. Um, if you do the thought experiment of looking at the spiral arms of a galaxy and ask uh, what will happen to that material given the differential rotation, the fact that the galaxy is rotating uh, faster as you go out, then you would work out that at the speed of those stars, the galaxy in a few billion years would be completely wound up. So the spiral arms would be wound super tight because the middle part is rotating slower than the outer parts. Um, and that means that logically after some billions of years, the spiral arms should not be visible because they'd be so uh, tightly wrapped that it would look more like the grooves of a record, an old fashioned LP record than a few elegant spiral arms. So it's been known for a long time that the spiral arms are not, you know, physically fixed entities. They actually arise because of density waves in the galaxy, uh, which are enhancements in density that cause enhanced star formation at the locations of those enhancements. The stars that form in them have a higher velocity and are moving in this differential rotation way. Uh, so it's a basically a pattern speed rather than a physical speed of the stars forming the spiral arms. Now this is a sense of which this, is, this could be both a transverse and a longitudinal way because one of the other parts of the explanation of how star formation occurs in spiral galaxies is that it has a sort of contagion effect where a region of star formation can trigger star formation in a nearby volume of space. And that actually happens because of the compression of gas and supernovae. And that effect is basically a longitudinal wave. It's a longitudinal propagation of star formation by explosions and supernovae. So in that sense, yes, uh, spiral galaxies do have a longitudinal component of their spiral pattern. Ready for the next question. Francesco, who's on with us live, 
asks, is it true that string theory is dead and that no one works on it anymore? Um, both are very strong statements with an element of truth. So string theory is not dead. It's not in great shape, however, and that's simply because the theory is extremely difficult to work with um, and progress has been very slow. String theory has been around since at least the early 80s, so that's a few decades now. Um, and progress has been slow. There have been a few innovations, a few breakthroughs that give hope to the people working on it that it is a deep and satisfying underlying explanation of the nature of matter and the way the forces of nature work. Um, but reproducing uh, standard gravity theory and the predictions of general relativity in a theory that has a completely different underlying basis of strings uh, has not really succeeded yet. Uh, maybe it's still too early to expect that. It's a very difficult calculation. Uh, so most people, physicists, you know, if they're not acolytes of the theory and they're not extreme skeptics, they probably give string theory a C for how well it's doing. Now that's quite different from the beauty and elegance and potential of the theory to be a fundamental theory of nature. People still are drawn to it for that reason. As for people not working in it, there's definitely been a backlash, and that's some very prominent physicists have spoken to this. Books have been written about string theory and its failures, and they're contributing to the backlash. Uh, and the most extreme framing of that, of course, is that uh, an entire generation or two generations of bright young physicists were lost to string theory. The verb is a very strong verb because many of these physicists have done excellent work and have permanent jobs in their field and are doing other things as well, so they're not really lost. Um, however, it is true that the number of young theorists going into string theory has declined from its peak in the probably in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, to a very modest level. There were some time, maybe 20 years ago, when the number of string theorists in a physics department uh, might be up at like 20 or 25 percent of their total number of faculty. And that has changed over time. Physics departments have grown, people have changed fields or retired. Uh, I think the presence of string theory in, in a big physics department is still there, but it may be at the 10 percent level. So that's not dead. It's just retreated to a more modest part of the overall physics enterprise. Ready for the next question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, our next question from a live viewer is, what is your favored model of how the universe will end given its parameters like flatness? And what will that actually look like? I mean, my favored model based on what we've measured so far is, of course, infinite endless expansion. Uh, in a physics sense, this will be a heat death. Um, that's a strange term because actually as the universe expands, it gets colder and colder stars eventually all go out or expire. We're left with stellar remnants. Structure is lost, entropy wins. The second law of thermodynamics dictates the gradual erosion of structure. And although we don't understand fundamental theories of matter enough to be confident, supersymmetric theories predict that normal matter will decay, that protons have a finite lifetime. The experimental bound on that is now well over 10 to the 36 years, I think. So it's a very long time for normal matter to decay. But if that happens, then even the structure of atoms will be eventually lost. So that's the fate of the universe is a structureless, um, by structureless I also mean that uh, gravitationally bound entities like solar systems or galaxies themselves uh, dynamically evaporate, which is to say they gradually become unbound and the objects within them scatter over interstellar or intergalactic distances. So that's the preferred model of how the universe ends up in, in all of this within the envelope of an accelerating expansion due to dark energy. That also is uncertain because we don't know quite enough about the nature of dark energy to predict the super far future of how that cosmic expansion will go. If we judge it based on its current strength as measured by observations now, uh, we could predict endless accelerating expansion and extrapolate, but it's a little dangerous to extrapolate when we don't know the physical nature of dark energy. So the uncertainties in our long-term prediction about the universe are twofold. They're the nature of dark energy, and they're also the nature of fundamental matter, of whether 
matter is stable, whether supersymmetric theories apply. And given that, we can make predictions, but those are some pretty big unknowns. Ready for the next question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, our next question is from a live viewer, uh, Suleiman Suleiman, who asks, I heard that the stars in astronomy are and used to be used for navigation and travel, especially in ancient times. Is it still true today? And will we be taught about navigation in the course at all? Um, celestial navigation with stars, that's not really a part of the course, either the, the classical survey of astronomy course or the astrobiology course. Um, it would sit maybe more naturally in a, in a history of astronomy class. Uh, so celestial navigation is now is pretty much obsolete. I mean, basically, advanced timekeeping and GPS have essentially removed the need for navigation with the stars. Um, stars were used, of course, to keep time uh, and to navigate on the surface of the Earth. Uh, our timekeeping using atomic clocks is vastly better than any clock keep uh, timekeeping we can do with the stars, and our GPS satellite system using corrections for general relativity at the level of a trillionth of a second in the timing uh, means we can position ourselves on the earth to fractions of a meter. The best GPS signals that the military have that we don't use commercially are down at the level of a centimeter. Uh, so basically stellar navigation and stellar astronomy is pretty much obsolete. It's been superseded by technology. Um, and that's why it would only really be taught in a purely historical astronomy class and not unfortunately in mine because we had to be selective on the topics. Ready for the next question. All right, thank you, Chris. And that question makes me realize or makes me think also that sometimes we'd still use celestial navigation for spacecraft, but mm -hmm. not so much on Earth. Um, right. So Sarah Silva asks, can dark matter or could dark matter just be normal matter but the Higgs field that's affecting it is somehow different and giving it a higher mass. Um, if the Higgs mechanism is the mechanism that ascribes mass to fundamental particles, so the detection of the Higgs boson or Higgs particle uh, in 2015, 2016, uh, actually 2013, five years ago, six years ago now, um, is the mechanism by which normal particles, protons, electrons, neutrons, uh, and quarks, get their mass. Uh, the dark matter particle, we assume to be a fundamental supersymmetric particle, like a neutralino, that's the favored candidate, or possibly an axion, that's another potential candidate that's beyond the standard model of particle physics. It, it will still get its mass from the Higgs mechanism uh, but the Higgs mechanism itself does not explain why the dark matter particle has the mass it does. Remember, the dark matter particle has to be pretty much as abundant as neutrons or protons, uh, because in the end, massive and weakly interacting, because it adds up in the end to about six times the normal mass in the universe. So the Higgs mechanism is probably involved, but it's not an explanation. Just like the Higgs mechanism does not explain why. Protons and neutrons are 2,000 times more massive than electrons. And the hierarchy of mass, among other fundamental particles, is not explained by the Higgs mechanism. So we're still missing some pieces of our understanding of matter, even though we do have uh, a Higgs mechanism to explain where mass actually comes from. Ready for the next question. Um, the next question is kind of a quick one. Um, Robert Baker sent an email asking if you can suggest a book or a textbook that has some more advanced information, maybe even theory and mathematics for gravitational waves, but then I thought also maybe you could suggest one that was more popular that could explain gravitational waves to anybody. Yeah, um, there are technical books, there are technical treatises on gravitational waves. I mean, there's actually so many that I, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but Cambridge University Press has a big uh, astronomy list. So if you go to Cambridge University Press, their astronomy section, I think there's like three or four textbooks at different levels, mostly at graduate level, that have gravitational waves described. 
and, and there are a number of other books too. Um, those are pretty highly technical though, so essentially only for researchers. At the popular level, there's been a spate of books, of course, because uh, gravity wave detection only a year, a couple of years ago was a really big event in, in physics and astrophysics. I think the most uh, fun read among those is Black Hole Blues by Jan Eleven. Jan Eleven is a, a professor at Barnard College in New York, and she's written some very nice popular science books, or I think her first one was called How the Universe Got Its Spots about cosmology when she was written as when she was a postdoc. And, and her writing is very interesting because that one combines sort of memoir style with writing about cosmology. In Black Hole Blue, she uses the interview format. She sort of embedded herself with the LIGO team and she gives a lot of you know, nice character sketches and biographical sketches and sort of you are there immersive descriptions of what it's like to be in the labs of these people, what it's like to be on site at LIGO. And of course she understands the physics and astrophysics really well and explains it really well. So Black Hole Blues, I would give a high nod to, and then modesty aside, I'll mention Einstein's Monsters, The Life and Times of Black Holes, which is my most recent popular book. And the last, there's a small number of chapters, eight chapters, I think. And the last chapter is all about gravitational waves and gravitational waves feature early in the book too, when I talk about how general relativity made predictions that gravitational waves exist that have only recently been confirmed. Ready for the next question? Um, the next question comes from, uh, again, an email from Daniel Cortez, who asks, our life on Earth is sustained in the basic elements um, from dust that were created in early supernova explosion, explosions. Based on the age of the universe, um, the synthesized process of elements and the quantity of those elements on Earth, would it be possible to estimate how many explosions or generations of stars our constituents in the history of life on our planet. So where did those come from? And could we ever find um, the nebula where all of that stuff came from? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, the sort of chemical archeology span of life in the universe or life on this planet, uh, not directly. So the simple answer is no, not directly, because these heavy elements that were created in the centers of stars by fusion and then ejected into space either by circulation within a massive star and an envelope being ejected or by the violent detonation of a supernova where a lot of the heaviest elements come from and then they get ejected far into space these processes um, occur have occurred multiple times so in our position in the milky way given the massive stars have very short lives like a few million years 10 million years there have been uh, dozens and perhaps hundreds, a couple of hundred cycles of star, massive star birth and death uh, in our part of the galaxy whose material would subsequently form, even, even four and a half billion years ago when the Earth formed, could have seeded space with heavy elements. So it's just a long and complex chemical history involving dozens and dozens and dozens of generations of star birth and death and then the incorporation, incorporation of those heavy elements into rocky bodies eventually the planet the earth and so on and life on earth uh, and so we can't trace it directly we can only say in a statistical sense how it might have happened roughly how many generations of stars were involved roughly how far those elements could have traveled and they could have traveled quite far in billions of years with the typical stellar motions of the milky way um, the material that we're made of, some of the heavy elements in our bodies, for example, could well have traveled thousands of light years to get to our bodies uh, uh, when our planet formed and eventually we formed. So it's a pretty fascinating history. It just can't be directly traced because, of course, chemical elements and atoms and heavy elements don't have any markers on them. They're all generic and identical to each other. So there's nothing about a particular carbon atom, nitrogen, iron, whatever it is, to tell you where it came from or where it was formed. Ready for the next question. All right, our next question is from Shreyas, who is on with us live, and asks, what are the origins of dark energy and what do we know of its nature? 
dark energy must have been built into the Big Bang at the beginning. So dark energy, whatever it is, is part of the initial conditions or the framework of the expanding universe right from its origin. Uh, we witnesses its effect now after 14 billion years where it manifests as a negative pressure operating in the vacuum of space to cause space-time to an expand at an accelerating rate. That's how we diagnose dark energy. But dark energy as a physical entity must have been present in the Big Bang. So it's an ingredient of the universe going back to the beginning. And in that sense, we're profoundly ignorant of dark energy because there's no part of the Big Bang model that requires dark energy to exist at all. Uh, it was a surprise when the acceleration was detected in the mid-1990s. And we still don't have any physical handles on what dark energy is, nor is it a natural prediction of our existing theories of physics. So we're really in the dark and, in, and not doing too well in pinning down what dark energy is. Uh, but it's obviously the single largest ingredient in the pie chart of the universe of what the universe is made of. About two thirds of the physical universe is this component called dark energy. Uh, and it's probably the biggest unanswered question in astronomy, what its nature is. Ready for the next question. All right, uh, the next question is from Hernan, who is following along with our astrobiology course right now and sent an email question. Um, he's very interested in the promise of life on solar system moons, such as Europa, Enceladus, and Titan, and would like to know if you think there is any chance of, for example, people in their 60s getting a chance to see data from a mission to one of these amazing solar system moons? Uh, I think so. I mean, these are difficult missions. Uh, planetary scientists are united in, in thinking that an advanced mission to Europa or Titan or Enceladus, those are the three top targets, but not the only ones at all in the outer solar system, is a very high priority. The time of this, the timing is tricky though. You say people in their 60s, yes, they could live to see it, but it does take 20 years or so to design a mission, build it, launch it, get it out there, which takes five, six, seven years, depending on the trajectory, and then get the data back. Um, you don't have to wait for the mission to come back, you're just transmitting the data at the speed of light, so that part is quick. Um, so we have the Europa Clipper that's planned. Uh, it's a little bit of a modest mission. It's not going to have a lander at the moment, or that might be changed to have a lander. It's not going to drill down under the ice for a look at the European Ocean. Um, and for Titan, we're still up for grabs. People are trying to get a Titan mission on the table in NASA, but NASA just doesn't have enough funds to do really both Europa and Titan in the same decade. And as for going back to Enceladus, that's also on the table in the design phase, but it doesn't have any hope of a start. Uh, so the difficulty of doing more than one of these deep space moon missions at a time is very limiting. The Europeans are also in the game and they're contributing and most of these missions are collaborative because they're so expensive that it makes sense for Europe and the United States to collaborate, but they have similar constraints. So unfortunately, as exciting as life on moons in the solar system is, and as plausible a prospect as it is, it is going to take two decades pretty much to find out a lot more than we know now. Ready for the next question. All right. Um, the next question is from a live viewer. Destined Life is on with us and asks uh, a great question about light and black holes. How is it possible that light, which is the fastest thing in the universe, cannot escape the gravitational force of a black hole, even though light has no mass. Right. Well, light has no mass, although photons do have an equivalent mass. So light not having a mass is not strictly true, because in, in the physics definition of a photon, they have an equivalent mass by equals mc squared. And you can even conceptualize the fact that mass bends light as being consistent with the fact that light does have an equivalent mass. Um, but the question as to why the fastest thing there is can't get out of a black hole, I think the best way to think of it is in terms of the gravitational redshift. So one of the core predictions of general relativity is that uh, radiation loses energy when traveling out of a gravitational potential. 
So this has been confirmed on the Earth, which is not a, an intense gravity object at all. Uh, the prediction that has been made was made right back 100 years ago with general relativity, that radiation traveling upward in a gravity field like the Earth's would lose a tiny amount of energy. Uh, and so it would be redshifted. Uh, that's the gravitational redshift. And that gravitational redshift was detected uh, in terrestrial experiments in the 1960s, I think. And it's been confirmed since then with high precision. So gravitational redshift does occur. And basically, once you've seen that light can lose energy by traveling in gravity, then you can just figure out how much energy it would lose if the gravity was intense. And there is a level of gravitational field or pull at which the predicted redshift is infinite. And logically, that essentially means the light loses all its energy. So that's, that's a sort of different way of thinking about light trapped in a black hole. Uh, the idea being that the radiation still exists, but it is losing essentially all of its energy, is redshifted uh, or stretched in wavelength equally to incredibly low energy and is operationally therefore trapped and can't get out. And therefore the black hole looks black because all the energy of the radiation is lost by the extreme redshift. Ready for the next question. The next question is, question from a live viewer is on from uh, Colvinder Garayle, who asks, what are the benefits of studying the universe in radio, optical, infrared, and X-ray light? Um, astronomy now is sort of very panchromatic, is, is operates at all these wavelengths that were mentioned in the question. Until, you know, little less than 100 years ago, the only astronomy was optical astronomy. We had telescopes since the time of Galileo, and for the first three centuries, that's all we had. Starting in the 1930s, um, radio astronomy grew, and then in the 50s and 60s, X-ray and infrared astronomy, and then gamma ray, and so on. The advantage of working at these different wavelengths is that you find, you essentially will find physical phenomena that are tuned to the wavelength of observation. So when you look at radio waves, you're mostly looking at the low energy universe because radio waves are low energy radio waves. Uh, the microwave background is a good example. That's the extremely cold radiation from the, at a, just under three degrees Kelvin left over from the Big Bang. And so you need a radio telescope to detect that. A lot of the radio emission from the Milky Way galaxy happens, comes from quite cold regions between stars. Um, and at the temperatures of 10, 50, 100 Kelvin. So radio astronomy is used typically to look at the cold universe. Optical astronomy is used to look at the medium temperature universe, the temperature of stars and galaxies. Galaxies are just made of stars. Stars have temperatures ranging from a few thousand Kelvin for a red dwarf up to maybe 50,000, 40,000 Kelvin for a hot white dwarf or a, a blue supergiant. That's the middle regime of temperature. And then when you get to the long short wavelength facilities like ultraviolet X-rays or gamma rays, you're looking at the high energy universe or the hot universe. And so ultraviolet and X-ray telescopes are looking at temperatures typically of hundreds of thousands or millions of Kelvin. And that corresponds to very hot gas in clusters of galaxies uh, and uh, superheated gas near black holes, for example, accelerated by black holes in their jets or active galaxies, the vicinities of black holes where accretion is taking place. And the highest energy of all would be gamma rays. And those are just the tail of very, very high energy phenomena corresponding to effective temperatures of hundreds of millions or even billions of Kelvin, extreme astrophysics. So that's how the wavelengths of astronomy are used. They're tuned to these different types of astrophysics in different temperature regimes. Ready for the next question. The next question is from Will Suttles, who is on with us live, who asks, is there radioactive heating going on inside the Earth? And if so, is the lava coming up in Hawaii radioactive? Uh, yes, there is radioactive heating going on in the Earth or, or any rocky planet. So there's natural radioactivity in any rock because uh, rocky material has heavy elements, has a natural level of uranium, uranium and plutonium and uh, you know, long half-life radioactive elements occur naturally in rock. It's a very low concentration, of course, one part parts in a trillion typically compared to hydrogen or helium. 
but it does occur in rocky material. And so in the aggregate of a large rocky mass, there will be a significant amount of radioactive heating, and that heat has to go somewhere. If it's strong enough, the heat can, of course, make the rock molten, and that can lead to tectonic activity or magma, uh, because when rock is in a liquid form, it can percolate and move and have differential forces and penetrate the crust, the cooler crust of a surface of a planet, and that's essentially what volcanism is. So radioactive heating does exist in the Earth, and we can measure it. Uh, some part of that uh, heating of the Earth is actually due to the fact that the Earth hasn't completely cooled from its formation. Uh, and we see the same effect in other objects in the solar system, that some little part of their internal heating is actually caused by the fact that they are still contracting, especially the gas giant planets. The Earth is not really contracting particularly. Uh, most of that is just simple radioactive rock. Uh, when you get to a very small object, the radioactive heating goes with the mass of the rocky material, so something like an asteroid or a comet, uh, the radioactive heating is essentially minimal. And, and typically, the only heating you'll see might come from stresses caused by gravity when the object is in an elliptical orbit around a bigger object. But radioactive heating is, is seen widely, it's understood, uh, it scales with the mass of the object in the solar system. Ready for the next question? All right, so we have uh, sort of two related last questions for today. We're going to wrap up um, and have you uh, talk to some folks about careers in astronomy. I also want to take this opportunity to plug our podcast called The Star Field. Um, if anyone is interested in learning about astronomy from an undergraduate student perspective, you should check that out. Um, but uh, Zahir and Pablo are both studying astronomy and they have questions related to pursuing um, a career in astronomy. Pablo has been told that there's no work for um, people studying space science, uh, you know, like a master's degree. And um, Zahir is, wants to know whether it's better to study math, physics, and chemistry or math, physics, and computers when studying, uh, when trying to pursue an interest and in career in astronomy. Okay, um, I'm glad to get these questions. I'll answer them. Uh, they're, they're, they need different answers. The question of whether there are jobs in astronomy, it's an important one, a significant one. Anyone setting off on the road of studying astronomy obviously wants to know the answer to that question. And the answer is, it's a niche field. Um, but there are jobs in astronomy. Uh, it's a niche field in the sense that it, I would say overall it's about 15% of the size of physics, or it's 15% of physics, because academic astronomers tend to work in physics departments, and the typical size of the astronomy or astrophysics component of a physics department at a big university is the astrophysics group will be typically 15% of the faculty. So those are some set of the jobs that astronomers do. They work in universities, they teach astronomy, and often physics, because they're trained in physics initially. Uh, and they do research in their subject in an academic setting. Um, a similar number uh, also do astronomy in smaller settings of two-year colleges. So the, the first group I was talking about were the, at the research universities where you can do research, get grants, where there may be astronomy facilities you can use to do your research. There's another significant set of astronomers who are mostly doing teaching. They're not doing active research because their schools essentially don't have access to those facilities. Although any person at a university or institute can use national observatories like uh, the NRAO, VLA, and the national observatories at KIPP. Um, so that's another set of astronomers who are mostly doing teaching, and they're also typically in physics departments or sometimes just science faculties of small schools that are not big enough to have physics departments. So academic astronomy is a significant way for people to go. And, it, and given that astronomers are not sort of creating wealth and making objects that are part of some e obvious economic system, uh, they're in a knowledge economy, basically. So they are most likely to be teachers and researchers. Another modest number of astronomers work at national observatories or labs. These can be places like the National Observatories, optical and radio, or national labs like Livermore, Los Alamos. These are primarily physics and technology labs, but they do employ astronomers or astrophysicists. 
Um, and there's some smaller, yet smaller number of astronomers that work with foundations or think tanks or policy groups. They're bringing their astronomy expertise, but also a slightly broader science uh, communication and policy perspective. And that's a destination of a lot of astronomers. Um, so there are jobs. There are not a vast number of jobs, but I would, you know, it's measured now. The unemployment among physics PhDs, including astronomy PhDs, is under 5%. Uh, it's not zero, so you know there are out-of-work astronomers, uh, but that's that's a pretty low unemployment rate. So that's the positive answer to the question. If you're motivated to do it and you're well trained in it, and you're persistent and you're flexible in your potential path and outcome, then you can very likely get a job. The second question as to what's the best combination of subjects to study to be an astronomer or to get a job in astronomy, that's a little harder to be explicit about. Most astronomers, most professional astronomers, people working as astronomers, have a training in physics. Their core training was physics, which just really means physics, and they took a lot of math, too. So math and physics are the core disciplines of professional astronomers, and which is to say that two-thirds, maybe up to three-quarters of all astronomy PhDs did their bachelor's degree in physics, or potentially physics and astronomy. Um, Bleeding in another discipline as a minor is not definitely a good idea. If you want to be an astrobiologist, then obviously having chemistry or biology as a minor, uh, it's harder to do it with chemistry with the biology than chemistry is a good idea. Uh, computer science is always a good idea for astronomers because many astronomers work in data areas in the career path that I didn't mention in my first answer, another career path, for astronomers who often work with big data and always, always are programming in various ways to reduce their data or understand their data or simulate the universe, any number of reasons. Um, computational techniques are paramount in astronomy now. And so anyone who has that as their core skill set is well positioned. And of course, doing that more and making that perhaps your career goal is a possibility too. So I'd say computer science is probably the most useful second string in your bow to have if you're an astronomer. Uh, chemistry would be maybe a second choice, biology a third choice, because astrobiology is a, is a niche field, but a kind of growing field. That was uh, good to get questions about the profession, because I do hope to encourage you know some of you to go into astronomy. It's a, it's a, a small group, but it's a nice tribe. It's a good tribe to join if you're motivated to. And, like math and physics particularly, that would be the first thing you would ask yourself before getting into this, because it doesn't really start with astronomy. It starts with those core disciplines in science. Um, but thank you for your questions. And as always, they were good and interesting and varied. And we'll be back with you, I think, again, two weeks from now. We're trying to keep up our regular pattern of every two weeks. OK, thank you and goodbye. All right, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. This is Matthew and Victoria here in Tucson, and we hope that you have a great week and weekend. Take care.